especially when you have an old desktop computer processing. As we wait to get started, a special shout out and thank you to Max and Brittany on my team who are helping. Uh, it looks like I am streaming. I'm just gonna verify. Yes, we are live. So welcome everyone. Let me close my Facebook. Hi everyone, I think you all, I, I see a lot of familiar faces, but also some new ones. Um, so I'm Stephanie Thomas, a state representative uh, uh, representing the 143rd district, which comprises parts of Norwalk, parts of Wilton and parts of Westport. Um, I, um, I know I'm expecting, I don't see them yet, but I know a couple of my um, esteemed colleagues are planning to join today. Um, if I see them later, I will uh, be sure to point them out. Um, so thank you all for joining us uh, this lovely Saturday morning. Um, I wanted to do this event um, because uh, I had the good fortune of meeting Jay Petro, our speaker, a few years ago, and uh, he transformed my own personal uh, space. Uh, here at home. And the more I started to learn about lawns and flowers and pollinators and whatnot, the more I started to question, um, I, I feel like most people are saying like, why should we get rid of our lawn? But it made me start to think, why do we even have them in the first place? <laughs> it, like, is it the excess water usage? Um, I know, you know, here in Norwalk, there's so many days or drought days we're not allowed to water. Um, you know, the time spent mowing it is astronomical. In fact, when my husband and I were house hunting, he said his only criteria was not to have any lawn because it was just a waste of time, but we ended up with quite a big lawn. Um, the cost of maintenance, um, part of when we um, moved here, we had really had to do a cost benefit analysis of like what it would cost to buy a mower, edgers, like all the lawn care versus outsourcing it to someone else. So I was interested in doing this event and I'm so pleased that my good friend, um, Jay Petro of Petro Gardens Landscape Design um, agreed to join me. So we will discuss today um, our lawns and how we can transform them easily into something that's more environmentally friendly. Um, a little bit about Jay. He's an artist. You can see some of his artwork behind him. Um, he's a former magazine art director. He studied at the New York Botanical Garden Landscape Design Program. He currently instructs at the Garden School of Horticulture, former vice president of the Association of Professional Landscape Designers of Connecticut, and on and on and on. He does everything. Um, so welcome, Jay. Thank you for joining us. Um, so you. what I'd like, yeah. So what I'd like to do, we'll jump right in. Um, Jay will uh, share his screen and take us through a presentation, and then we'll open it up for Q and A. Um, feel free to pop questions in the chat, um, which you can find at the bottom of your screen at any point along the way, and we'll answer them at the end. If I see a lot of clarifying questions come up, I'll interrupt Jay and make sure he answers it. Um, and we'll also, at some point, Brittany or Max, if we can pop into the chat, uh, uh, Jay's website, that would be uh, great as well. So without further ado, Jay, take it away. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Stephanie. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, okay, so um, welcome everyone. I'm really glad you decided to join us this morning and Stephanie, um, as she, she mentioned, we, we met and I, I did a design for her property using a lot of pollinator plants. We reduced her lawn somewhat, but she, as she said, she does have a pretty big lawn. I started doing this presentation a couple of years ago uh, when we were in a drought and I was doing this in conjunction with 
uh, aquarium because they were explaining the drought and the severity of it in our area. And I said, well, there are things that people can do to help with lowering their water usage. And I wanted to show people ideas so that they could possibly go forward. So just to give a little background about me, I, I grew up in Queens, New York. Uh, this was my typical lawn at my junior high school. You know, we played stickball and, and paddleball, whatever. Um, and then this is me with my siblings with our little postage stamp front lawn. And at this yeah, point, it, it always I knew I was seemed, my life and it always seems uh, odd that everyone had this little plot of of grass in front of their houses, even though it was so so teeny. Uh, Eventually I became a magazine designer and then I said, now yeah, there's not a lot of old art directors around. I better figure out what I really want to do when I grow up. So I studied at the, the horticulture school at the New York Botanic Gardens and I became a landscape designer. And I've been working uh, with the Aspetuck Land Trust and Earth Place, uh, doing some, some garden design in their parks and at Earth Place here in Westport putting in pollinator lawns, I mean, pollinator gardens. And I know that I've, I've in dealing with clients, a lot of clients don't want to get rid of, uh, don't want to get rid of their lawns. And I'm not proposing that people get rid of them. I'm just saying it's helpful to reduce them if possible for various reasons which we'll go into. So just to give a little background, why do we love our lawns? Um, lawns really were not native to America we basically had a lot of prairie lands and wooded areas. Um, it's more traditionally a British thing. And so when the British came here, they brought this idea of having a lawn. Um, Doug Tallamy is a, a ecologist said, you know, evolutionary psychologists believe that we humans like huge spreading lawns without any visual obstructions because you wanna be able to see what danger may be out there. So that, that may have been more valid at some point. I mean, um, you know, clearing the land around your property. Um, however, now, uh, you know, we have mowers and uh, back in World War I, President Wilson decided to cut down on maintenance costs at the White House. So I had the herd of sheep, flock of sheep acting as lawn mowers. So one of the things that held up the evolution of lawns was there was no lawn mowers and there was no irrigation. And without those proponents helping to sustain a lawn, the lawns really weren't gonna make it. But eventually around uh, World War I, a little bit after the mower came into play. And um, so now um, people, the American Garden Club actually tried to convince all homeowners that it was their civic duty to maintain a beautiful and healthy lawn. And I'm almost saying that maybe it's our civic duty now to start to eliminate our lawns and, and to cut back on the resources that are required to have them. Irrigation, watering, uh, this is actually, some of these stats are a little bit old, but it's the largest irrigated crop in the United States. And if you really think about that, I mean, so much of our area is covered by lawn. 20,000 gallons of water per year per lawn. Um, and 30 to 60% of our supplies are being used on lawns. So as water becomes a rarer commodity, um, it's really essential and this is happening out West and um, you know, areas that have severe drought or typical drought uh, for people to not even be allowed to have lawns. So the idea of this presentation is, okay, what do we do? What do we replace our lawns with? It'd be nice if we could have bubble mowers and not really uh, spew out gas, gas fumes, but one option is people put in these planting beds. And it's, again, a very high, highly needed resources. There's mulching, there's weeding, it's very few native plants. So I don't think this is a great solution. One solution could be artificial grass and some people have started using this. There is a big uptick in synthetic grass. Um, probably better used out, out west or areas that are you know, having drought problems. But as we talked about, it's gonna save a lot of water usage and um, actually doesn't even look so bad. And the maintenance costs, much lower. 
so maybe for a small lawn, you know, in, in some some areas, it might, might work. Uh, of course, pets might be a problem, but you know, it's never going to yellow. And uh, I, actually, I don't have any experience with a uh, artificial turf, so I can't speak to the pet use. Another alternative is to plant lawn areas with no mow lawns. So these are a mix of fine fescues, uh, wavy hair grass, sheep fescue, hard fescue, blue fescue mix. These uh, grasses are generally meant to be cut maybe once or twice a year. Uh, they're tolerant of extreme drought after they're, they're uh, established. Uh, they don't require watering or fertilization. And a lot of these uh, fescues can actually grow in some shade. So this, this could be an alternative if you're not playing on, on the field, so to speak. Um, it can look really good. And certainly for those hard to reach areas with a mower, um, you know, it's covering the ground, you don't have the weeds, and it, it's a good alternative. The other issue with lawns, as many people know, is in the shade. Uh, a lot of times people will seed every year, and then after things start to dry out, the trees start to absorb all the moisture, the lawn sort of disappears, and you're left with sort of a dirt patch. So one of the ways that we can cover the, the ground to keep down weeds and to make it look green is to use plantings. Uh, in shade, a lot of ferns, there are some aggressive spreading ferns like hay scented fern that will start to cover the area. Uh, there's other ferns that you know, grow very naturally. And, and I look, as all landscape designers, look to nature and to see what's happening out there and how, how things have been handled naturally with ground covers. Um, there's flowers that you can put in, and I'm going to go into a lot more flowers at, at some point. Uh, but a lawn here might not work at all. It might be difficult to mow. And so having a mix of ferns and some grasses, and there's a perennial sweet woodruff, which grows in wooded areas. So you get some flowers, and you basically have a green, green base. And the idea is really to, to cover the ground to keep weeds down. Here's some hosta. I know hostas around here uh, have issues with deer eating them. But if you are in an area that might not have so many deer or, or fenced in backyard, uh, hosta can be a great ground cover. Uh, a couple of years back, I, I took a week long sort of native plant study out in Black Rock Forest. And it was really interesting for me to see how in these wooded areas, like the typical builder in our area will clear cut every tree on a new property and then they'll establish lawn, maybe with sod or seed. And I just wish they would reserve some areas from uh, this total cut down and, and maybe plant some, in this case, black huckleberry. Uh, this was in the fall, so it looks pretty stunning color-wise. But even just leaving the leaves in a, in a wooded area, maybe planting some ferns, it's a lot better ecologically and a lot less resources to use. I mean, a, an average lawn is, is like watering and mowing and fertilizing, weeding, and there's pest control, and there's funguses, and aerating, dethatching, and then reseeding, and it's constant constant resources. So if you can establish something like this kind of planting, uh, it's gonna be a lot less resources. Now it's a sort of wild look and we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but this is sort of how nature handles it. So I think we can learn some lessons from observing nature and how they've gotten along without mowing. Uh, in the sun where our typical lawns are, we can actually plant uh, grass meadows. We can plant mixes of grasses and perennials. Uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to talk about a couple of different ways that this can be done. Um, one, one is with planting live plants into an area, and the other is seeding an area. And the idea, again, is to cover, cover the area, cover the ground, and that prevents weeds from coming up. 
And typically with a meadow, you cut back in early spring one time, and then that's it. You leave it up through the winter. So you're, again, you're not watering, you're not fertilizing, you're not mowing. It's a lot less resources. And I know people think about meadows as these big areas, but it doesn't have to be so big. And one of the reasons that these meadows require a lot less uh, watering is because of the, the roots of these plants that are in meadows. Here you can see they're like eight to 15 feet long. And so they can get down and, and pull out a lot of moisture out of the ground. If anyone's ever pulled up any turf, it's a couple of inches and people, you know, builders or landscapers put down like two inches of topsoil and then you put sod or grass seed. And it requires constant moisture because the, the surface is drying out in the hot sun. So one of the areas that you can really see a big difference is this. I don't know if people have been to Storm King Art Center uh, across the river in, um, in New York, but uh, Daryl Morrison who's a landscape architect who was teaching this class at, that I took in Black Rock created all these meadows for Storm King. So this used to be all lawn. And what they did was they killed off the lawn and they seeded the meadows. So the cut down on the maintenance, amazingly so. But besides that, it's just so much more interesting and it funnels you know, your views towards these gorgeous sculptures that are laid out around the landscape. And these are the kinds of things that you could do on your property. Uh, doesn't mean you have to eliminate the lawn, you could have your play areas. But if you have, maybe we call it the rough or a meadow, uh, you know, on, on golf courses, they, they have, you know, areas that are unmowed. And it's just, it requires so much less resource. Um, this is a uh, mixed planting in the foreground is little blue stem and the background is switchgrass. So you just have two different grasses. It looks a little bit more organized. So, and then you have the advantage of it blowing in the wind, gives life to your property. Uh, lawns really don't help you in this regard. Uh, in the fall, uh, goldenrod and asters really kick in. So mixing those with grasses, this is at the Greenwich Audubon Center. Uh, it's a beautiful meadow that they planted. Um, this is at the Newman Poses Meadow in Westport. I don't know if people have been there, but these red leaf uh, shrubs are actually high bush blueberry. And there's just this natural meadow of grasses and, and some goldenrod. It's really amazing. So this is in my backyard and then I've sort of cut out different areas to eliminate lawn. And, you know, my purpose, besides just loving the visual look of grasses and, and these kind of meadows, uh, but I wanted to bring in birds and pollinators. And by having these kind of plants, uh, you know, the insects will come in, then the birds come in, you have seed heads from the grasses, you have places that smaller animals can hide and uh, shelter. Uh, you've got places for birds to nest. So you're creating an ecological uh, smorgasbord really here in your backyard. And there's this uh, pollinator pathway has been is instigated here in, in Westport and all the areas to connect backyards with these kind of native plantings so that birds and pollinators can migrate through an area because really a lawn is a desert for any kind of wildlife pretty much other than grubs. Um, here's a house I did in, in Weston. Uh, the, they didn't have irrigation because they were on a well and they, they didn't have enough water. So the front area here where you see this garden was burned out grass because it faced full south. And so we, we put in this pollinator meadow and it's just sort of a small area. You know, homeowner loves it, lots more uh, wildlife. Uh, this was a garden I did in, down in Greenwich. One of the uh, things with new construction now is you have to put in some kind of rain garden to collect any kind of 
water that comes on the downspouts uh, or runoff on your property. They don't want it going into the sewer system and then going into Long Island Sound where the fertilizers will start to uh, you know, pollute the sound. So some people just, they, they have these rain gardens and they, they plant lawns. Um, I took it as an opportunity to put in a lot of wetland plants that would look great. Uh, this is where it started and you can see how these pipes funnel into this, this area that's just supposed to absorb all the extra water. But by planting a meadow garden, and I uh, use meadow you know, in quotations because it's, it's not a big expanse. We're not talking acres. We're talking um, just, just a garden space in your, in your property. Mm -hmm. And in this case, there was an opportunity to have plants that can deal with wetter conditions down low and then plants that can deal with drier conditions up on the hill. So it, it, it was actually a number of uh, different ecological zones, so to speak. All right, I'm gonna go into a couple of different ways you can plant these. One is to plant a meadow with plugs. So these are starter plants and they're embedded into the ground, planted in, in whatever organization you want. So you have full control over the look, not that you have to have full control, but you can. So you can just plant a couple of types or you can spot in different, different you know, flowers. Uh, these come typically in trays of 18 or 32 or 50 of one kind of plant. So if you have a small area, you, you might not have that many varieties. They're pretty easy to plant. And here's a good example. I happen to be at this property in Weston uh, Richard Hartledge is a pretty famous uh, landscape architect out of the West. Out of, I think he's in Oregon, uh, but he flies around to do properties. And I happen to be there when they were planting all these black eyed Susan plugs. Uh, and obviously it looks a little sad, but on the cover of his book, this was the picture he used. And I was like, oh my God, that's the same thing that I was there. Cause you can see those balls and there was this water feature. So he chose to actually do a monoculture of just Black Eyed Susan, which actually spread and they reseed a lot. So, but you can see, you can see how powerful and how quickly these, these plants can grow in. And I, I use plugs a lot. I've used thousands and thousands of them. Uh, in later fall, uh, these grasses take on a whole different form. Uh, they turn to sort of wheat color and they, we keep them up through the winter. Uh, they can be mixed with evergreen plants as well. So you have some structure in the winter. Um, this is my backyard. It's not a huge area. It's maybe 20 by 30 feet that I've taken to, to just put in uh, these kind of meadow plants. Um, in the summer, it looks a little bit more vibrantly green and you have more color. And this is when all the birds and uh, pollinators come in. Again, mixing with evergreens, it's like, you can get a lot of different contrasts of colors and textures going. Uh, I mean, the, the possibilities are unlimited, really. And, you know, it helps to be knowledgeable about the plants, but in a lot of cases, just mixing them together and learning uh, how they look and, you know, you, you, it's hard to go wrong. I would say, as long as you're planting plants that like it in sun, or if it's if it's very dry, they can deal with some drought conditions. And I'll, I have a list of a few of these. Um, if it's shady, you want to put plants in that can deal with shade. So obviously, they need the right environmental conditions to thrive. Uh, this is something called sneezeweed, helenium. Deer don't eat it. The, found mostly the woodchucks don't eat it. Uh, it mostly comes in these hot colors, uh, but this is a meadow I planted up in, uh, in Stanford using plugs. The other way to do it is to plant a meadow by seed. So here you don't have as much control over the look. Uh, you can get seed mixes, you can limit the type of species. I've typically got deer resistant mixes that have perennials and grasses. First way 
you have to prepare, you have to get rid of whatever's there, whether it's lawn or weeds. There's a number of ways to do this. One is to manually dig out the grass and remove it. Uh, one is to spread like uh, newspapers over it, wet newspapers, cardboard, and kill it that way. You could spread plastic over the top and kill it that way. And uh, some people use herbicides. So the first year, typically with a seeded meadow, what you wanna do is not let anything go to seed. So any weeds that are, are coming up here, we wanna cut back and keep it like an eight, eight inch height. Uh, you know, if it gets to 12 or 16 inches, you just weed whack it back. And the idea here is to really just keep down the weeds and let the, the seeded new plants establish themselves. And, and grow in. The second year, you'll start to get flowers. Here's a lot of black-eyed Susans. And this was taken in August. And you can see on the left, the turf is all burned out. And on the right, the meadow is doing very well. There's no supplemental water happening here. So I think this is actually one of the best slides to show you the difference in what, what a meadow will look like versus burned out grass in the summer if you decide not to water. And if you decide to water, you know, we do have watering restrictions that come in and out. So uh, you have to think about that. Uh, there's certain species that will come in, they're called pioneer species. This is Coreopsis lanceolata. It's one of those great species. It will sort of cover the area. As the other plants start to develop and get bigger and bare soil disappears, the Coreopsis will start to fade out as well. Uh, this is Monarda fistulosa, which is a common name as bee bomb. It likes a little bit wet areas, uh, wetter. So sometimes if you throw out seed, like a uniform seed mix, certain plants will dominate in certain areas. So they'll self-select themselves where they'll prosper. And in that way, you'll get some variety or not, maybe it's this, the whole area is similar. Then after a couple of years, you start to get other plants forming that, that will eventually take over more of the meadow. So it's really a, a seven year process, they say, with a meadow as plants uh, mature. So the meadow will change its composition. Um, and this happens to be in a place where the deer sleep. Uh, I've seen them eat eat the black-eyed Susans, but there's so many plants that it's really, uh, you know, it's, it's thrived, it's done really well. Then you can get into hyper-designed spaces and gardens, which is what I aspire to do. Uh, so I'm gonna show you a few of those just to give you ideas of how other professionals do it and where you can go with this and how beautiful it can be versus a lawn. Um, Adam Woodruff, He's a great designer out of the Midwest. He did this property called Jones Road. And uh, he's got a mix. Everything is, seems to be on the lower side, lower than two feet tall for the most part. It's not intimidating. It's not this big overgrown mass of plants. Uh, and he's refined his color palettes. They have a lot of sculptures set into the, the garden, which as, as the movement of the plants and the grasses and the wind, and you've got the dancers, it's, it's pretty extraordinary. Uh, he's mixing in some non-native plants. So I'm not saying everything has to be a native plant. Um, there's some, some uh, Russian sage in the background there, but you can really get into groups of plants and layering of plants and mixing colors and shapes and textures. And one of the things I like best about these kind of gardens is how the light changes how it looks. The light in the early morning or the late evening, or even as you move into the fall, the, the angle of the sun changes so that the quality of the, the light changes. And the, so the garden is always evolving. A, a garden with a lawn is never evolving. It's just a flat green. So besides the ecological and resource benefits doing these gardens, I think the aesthetics are superior. Now this is obviously a late, late afternoon shot. And uh, you know, so the tops of the grasses are getting lit by the light. 
in a way, I mean, I'm sure this is totally designed, but in a way it looks sort of random, you know? So a lot of times you can just mix in plants, you get your, your plant palette and it can, it can be pretty extraordinary. There's no right or wrong way to do these kind of plantings. There is some, let's say artistic, uh, you know, resource needed where you can sort of visualize how the plants might look, what colors will go with each other, which textures, you know, spiky flowers versus other ones. Now, one thing I know that a lot of people might say, well, you know, it gets sort of wild and I don't really want that in my front yard or I don't, I, you know, I want it more contained. And so there's a, a couple of examples here where you can sort of frame this wild garden. And you can use formal elements like boxwood hedges. You can use uh, masonry, walkways, brick patios. You can have fences uh, and even just uh, lawns, like you know, crisply grown lawns separating certain areas, starts to break down the space into um, you know framed areas that I think are more aesthetically pleasing to us and doesn't look like everything is just going crazy. Here's here's an extreme example of this property done by Pete O'Doof, who designed the High Line, and he's started really this sort of new American, or sort of it's a world uh, way of designing with all these perennials and grasses. Uh, this is like a very formal court, but he's got formal elements of this boxwood, you know, round boxwoods and, and walkways mixed with these mixed meadow, basically, plantings. And um, so you can see in this kind of extreme, you know, formal setting, how this can work. Um, Again, you've got this sort of wild, loose areas and then very formal. So that sort of back and forth gives you structure, gives you structure in the winter. And it doesn't appear like the, maybe the, the land is overtaking you. Uh, this is a property I visited up in Millerton, Jack Highland and Larry Wente. They designed this garden and there was very little lawn around they use a lot of native plants, but they use the same concept of mixing structure with looseness. Um, they chose grasses and wildflowers, which always are blowing in the breeze to give them this informal quality. So I was really impressed that they're not professional landscape designers, one is an architect, and, but they clearly have that, that visual skill and the knowledge of the plants that really brought this property to life. And, even around the pool, I mean, the, the pollinators were going nuts on the, the plants. So obviously, if you're afraid of bees or allergic to bees, you might want stuff like this further away from your pool or where you're hanging out. But um, certainly the pollinators are more interested in the flowers than in you. And they use, again, these formal elements, blocks of colors, formal hedges. These are hornbeam hedges that are used in England. Uh, this, this contrast I, I found really intriguing. I think it's a great way to, to think about in, in our area. Uh, this on the right is Verbena bonariensis. It's somewhat uh, good in our zone. It can die out in the winter. It's, it's not native, but it, I just love how these purple flowers hover over the grass. So again, they've created these two blocks of color and texture that you know, again, no lawn. There's some lawn in the background there, but they've covered a lot. Here's a property that was landscaped with mostly all grasses. This is in Nantucket. So they kept some area of lawn, but they've let other areas just be developed with grasses. Um, again, trying to eliminate, not totally, but some of the lawn is helpful. And the other extreme example is the High Line, which is the number one visited place in New York. Um, here, the, in, to create the structure, they've really got concrete and steel and, and the entire city enclosing this wild garden. I think people love this because of the, the just the contrast from, from the hard steel to these loose waving grasses and uh, perennials. 
And it, it's really growing right out of the concrete. And the original uh, uh, impulse here was to, to have that look because these were old uh, railroad tracks where weeds and, and native plants were actually growing right out of the tracks. So they've kept that visual, but in a, in a modern way. Again, it's, this, this wild meadow could be anywhere, but then it's, it's in the middle of New York City, which uh, makes it great. I mean, there's so much more of interest than if this was just lawn and a couple of trees. Uh, another extreme example is a Jay, park. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt. I said I would warn you when you should start to wrap up. We have so many questions, so I'm warning you. <laughs> OK, I'll go faster. Um, this is another park by Peter Doof. Uh, highly designed groups, massive plants, uh, again, surrounded by the city. That's my daughter who visited in Chicago. Um, even after they flower these flower heads, they look gorgeous. Um, again, texture, colors, extraordinary. So I'm just going to wrap up then with some of the drought tolerant native plants that you could use. These are generally deer resistant. They'll support moths and butterflies and nectar. Uh, red switchgrass or any kind of switchgrass is a really native, great native plant. The seeds uh, so will stay through the winter. I'll see a lot of birds eating them. A little blue stem comes in blue and turns purple. I sort of showed you some pictures before. Prairie drop seed is a shorter one, uh, turns this orange color in the fall. Uh, pink muley grass almost like uh, sparklers, uh, just incredible flowers. That flower is pretty much in September. Verbena stricta on the left. I, I really like purples and mixed with the greens. And Monarda punctata, which is dotted mint. These two are very deer resistant. Uh, I showed you the lance leaf coreopsis and the lead plant on the right it takes a long time to develop, but then once it does, it takes up a lot of space. Uh, I went through sneezeweed. Uh, those are mostly hot colors. On the right is sunflower, helianthus, lemon queen, sort of a taller daisy like. Uh, blue indigo, false blue indigo flowers in the spring and then creates sort of a nice shrubby mass. Uh, I talked about the hay scented fern, which is great for ferns, mostly are shade and they like it moist. Uh, this one can grow in some sun. Uh, Leatris or blazing star is a great pollinator. And on the right here is the Sclepius tuberosa, the butterfly weed, which is the monarch buffalo, bu butterfly's main source of food. Uh, and then here are a couple of books you might consider reading up more on this. Maybe if, you know, they'll give you more detail about how to, how to actually plant these and what plants are good. Um, Covering the ground is not necessarily a native meadow thing, but it's about eliminating grass and, and using ground covers. And then the native plants in the Northeast can help you with that. Um, and for those of you who might be wanting to do this themselves, you might take a screenshot of this. These are some areas around here. Earth Tones is a, a native or two uh, nurseries. Uh, Gilberti's has some uh, native plants. And then online, you can order seeds and plants from Prairie Nursery or American Meadows. And I've ordered or gotten plants from these places. So these are uh, resale uh, to the public. And as well, um, the Aspen Tuck Land Trust has a plant sale where they sell a lot of these native plants in the trays. I think they have that in September and they've staged it out of Earth Place. So if you are uh, a member of uh, the Aspetuck Land Trust, they'll, they'll show you what it is. And I think that's it. So. That is, I, I won't describe it as, as that's it. Thank you for that masterclass. Um, the <laughs> questions have been coming in fast and furious. And um, for everyone attending, we'll get you the list of those plants and the books. Um, and that last slide of places where you might buy your own native plants just so don't be worried if you didn't get a chance to write it down. So I'm going to jump into some of the questions. I'm going to try and do this in order. Uh, and Adele asked, um, 
and I don't have it in front of me, but she asked about, um, is there an, uh, an increased risk of um, having ticks with some of these more um, natural uh, settings or landscaping? Yeah, um, I mean, that is a common question. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> typically with ticks, they, they do hang out in tall grasses. So um, there is an increased risk if it's near areas that you're walking. Uh, obviously, if you have a deer enclosed area, it's better um, if you have deer fence. Uh, I, I work in these uh, meadows all the time. I haven't gotten ticks, but I, it's, it's a big problem. So yes, I would say that's, it does increase your risk. But a lot of people spray for ticks on their lawns. So you can do that as well. Great, that was a very good question, Adele. Thank you, Jay. Um, Angela asks, what would be the best option for families with kids that play in the backyard? So I would take the area that they are playing in and, and take and keep that as long so they continue to play, but maybe peripherally around the outside of the property or in an area that they're not playing in, you can convert it to a garden or a meadow. Thank you. Um, we have a question from my esteemed colleague, Representative Jonathan Steinberg of Westport. And I think you answered this question subsequently, but he wanted, um, he asked for a list of easily obtained meadow grasses uh, and plants. But I think that list you provided at the end was a pretty comprehensive list. Um, so yeah. we will get that out to everyone. Um, Jonathan, if you have a follow up question, feel free to shout it out or throw it in the uh, chat. You get legislative um, priority. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Miriam asked a good question about an urban yard in Stamford. Um, and she mentioned um, she couldn't do a meadow, although I like the way you framed that a meadow does not have to be an expansive space, but could be uh, quite small. Um, but do you have any specific ideas for someone? And Miriam, feel free to come off mute if you want to explain your space further, um, but it's characterized in the chat as an urban yard yard. Um, any thoughts, suggestions? Uh, yeah, no, I, if you have a space that you can dedicate to these plants, it could be three feet by three feet. Um, it, it's really, if you, if you plant it, they will come. I've actually taken uh, aster plants off my truck to plant at a property and the bees descended on the asters, like they found it within seconds. So if you have an area, maybe it's eight feet by 10 feet, you could eliminate the lawn because it's ridiculous to mow in that small space. That picture I showed in my house growing up, you know, I wish I knew what I knew now, I would have eliminated the entire front yard and had a whole meadow there. And in certain areas like in Wisconsin where Daryl Morrison was teaching and they have a lot of meadow um, in their arboretums, uh, a lot of people have taken their small front yards and have converted them to these kind of native meadow plants planters, plant things. So do it, just do it. <laughs> just do it. Um, Adele has a very interesting question and she talks about whether, or she asks if you um, have ever heard of any negative reactions from neighbors who adore their manicured lawns about, um, you know, changing over. But I wanted to share a quick anecdote. As I said, Jay, um, we still have a lot of lawn, but we um, converted a good deal to a bunch of uh, flowers uh, and pollinators and tall grasses. And my neighbor, my neighbor one day sent me a photo and because I was always away at work and she would say, people stop and just stare at your house all day. I see them walking by. Now that I've been working from home in COVID, I see them like they're walking their dog, they're walking, pushing the baby stroller and they just stop and look. Um, so I would add that there are people who, I think people respond to nature and we get such a change of colors from April through like November. So it's always changing. And I think people just enjoy looking at it. But Jay, have you ever yeah. heard about any negative? Well, I will add, um, I, I, I did a house 
um, near, near the beach in Westport. Um, and it was like a strip, maybe six feet wide along this, the, the road. And the, the guy who, he really wanted this kind of garden and I was happy to give it to him. And the neighbors were walking by and they were, they were definitely very apprehensive about what he was doing. And now they all stop and they all talk to him and, and you know, they just say, oh, this is just amazing. Um, so, you know, I think as more people get used to this, maybe there'll be a little bit less resistance to the thought of it. Uh, it also helps to not, not have things that are just like six feet tall everywhere. So it looks very forbidding. Um, so a design can help people make sense of it and it doesn't look like a weed patch. It looks like a garden or a natural space. So that's my answer. That's a good point. I um I endorse your design work. Um, yeah, if I had done it myself, I, I'm not sure I would have gotten the same reaction. Um, uh, Celeste has a good question. Uh, other than the soft fescues and clovers, are there ground covers that can cover a small front lawn area that won't um, overcome any adjacent uh, garden beds? So, well, so basically. Yeah, like, so you mean not, not the no mow lawn fescues? Is that the question other than that? Yeah, or I, I think any type of ground cover that wouldn't just, you know, overcome. Yeah, no, there's, there's definitely, there are more aggressive ground covers and less aggressive ground covers. That book that I showed covering the ground has unlimited types and plants for different areas, whether it's shady or wet or dry. Um, and some, like I said, are more aggressive. And then sometimes in a ground cover, you want it to be aggressive. So it covers the ground and weeds can't get in. Um, you can put edging on. So if it's separated by a walkway, a stone walkway of some sort, then that's gonna keep it contained and it won't go into other flower gardens. Uh, but there are times you might have to weed out certain ones if they're aggressive. But there are non-aggressive, a lot of these Ornamental grasses are clumpers and they don't spread. They just sort of clump and maybe they seed once in a while and you just pull them out. So. Perfect, thank you. Um, from Deb, Jay, what kind of soil preparation is needed before planting plugs? So that's a good question. Um, most people think uh, the soil has to be enriched with compost and uh, other nutrients. We, we hardly ever do that unless it's almost uh, just, just clay and, and it just won't absorb any water. A lot of these meadow plants are used to growing in very bad conditions and they'll actually do better than the weeds. So when you enrich the soil, you're helping the weeds also. So to answer your question, generally do not enrich the soil. Do not, you know, add compost. Do not make it really fertile because a lot of these plants will flop. They won't really stand up. Uh, if they get too much water, they'll flop. Uh, so it's a good question. And, um, you know, the typical thought in most perennial gardens is, you know, enrich the soil and add compost and make it really rich. And um, generally these plants don't need that. That's a great point. Um, Cheryl has a question. Her soil is um, very acidic due to a large number of oaks and their acorns. Do you have a recommendation for ground cover in acidic soil areas or would one of those books be a good reference point? It's a good question. I don't have an answer. Um, <laughs> Cheryl, uh, you stumped him. <laughs> I did. Uh, you know, typically some of the uh, the plants, you know, you want to change the acidity of the soil, like the shrubs. And um, actually, I haven't come across that as a as a problem. There's uh, so I don't I don't have an answer for you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, what is the best time to plant? Angela asks. So the best time um, to plant live plants would be anywhere from March till May, maybe June. It depends if you have irrigation. Um, if you have things, if you have an ability to water things, they could be really be planted anytime. But 
during July and August is really a time when, uh, you know, obviously it's very hot around here and can be drought conditions. So it, it's more difficult to establish plants. So definitely in the spring and then early fall, late August, September, up to maybe beginning of October. Uh, if you plant after that, then it starts to get a little cold at night. The plants might not be able to root in properly before uh, the winter hits. And so you might get more of a plant loss that winter than if they were established and they had their root systems established. Um, Angela has a question that I hadn't thought of. <laughs> um, what should I plant if I'd like to avoid snakes? <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm afraid to go to your house, Angela. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. They didn't teach us that in landscape design school. <laughs> um, I don't no, know. We cover a thing. lot of wildlife. Yeah, Lisa earlier said her rabbits um, eat all the uh, black-eyed Susans, <laughs> and I've certainly had a lot of flowers disappear mysteriously, but... Yeah, it can be frustrating with the, the woodchucks, I think, do... The woodchucks and deer do more damage, but the rabbits also. Um, there are plants that are more resistant to those. I will not plant black-eyed Susans or echinacea uh, coneflowers if there's any woodchucks around because they'll eat them all right away. Um, I did a, a property a garden at Earth Place. Uh, it's a couple of thousand plants and I tried not to use anything that I thought would get eaten some things were still getting eaten. So it's, it's a little difficult to control nature. <laughs> Imagine. Yeah. Um, let's see, Pat has two questions. Um, one relates to, um, is there a grass alternative to use in a path? Um, her yard runs downhill and mulch has washed away. So she doesn't want to use concrete or stone. So, so I guess any sort of grass alternative. To, to like a path to walk on, right? I, I think so. And Pat, feel free to take yourself off mute if you want to clarify. I mean, I would think lawn grass would grow there. Those fescues, the no mow, um, which can be mowed, um, but they get longer and you usually just let them hang out, you don't cut them back. Uh, but if it's a well-traveled lawn, I mean, I would think just, uh, you know, using a mix of rye and fescues versus, you know, Kentucky bluegrass would, would work. Okay, because the, um, I've got a grass mixture down now and it's wearing out where I walk several times a day. It's wearing out, okay. And can you not put like stepping stones in to the grass? I'm trying to avoid that because um, I'm trying to have as much rain penetration as possible. Uh, well, there could be smaller stepping stones. Um, I mean, so I don't have an answer other than artificial turf that won't wear down uh, if you're walking on it constantly. Uh, it might just be that it's you know, you didn't give it time to get established. Is that possible? That's possible. Uh, wait another year, thanks. Yeah, and, and, and reseed in the fall and reseed in the spring. Just keep reseeding to, to thicken it up and get it stronger. Yeah. And um, from David, he has two enormous trees, oak and tulip over his property. Um, so he asked, what will my fall or spring cleanup challenges be with grasses and meadow plants? So if, they, if you have large trees, it's going to be shady and probably grasses, meadow grasses won't work there because they need full sun. Um, if you have, uh, like an oak tree is a good, a good tree to plant under because the roots go down deep versus maples where they're very shallow. So with the roots deep, they're not taking all the moisture from the surface. So if you, let's say you planted ferns and, and there are certain sedges that will work in shade, um, you just really would, you could just 
run a mower over it in the spring and just leave all the chopped up debris, including the leaves, um, or, or cut it back with a weed whacker of some sort. Uh, so yeah, does that answer the question? I think so, but David, feel free to chime in. Um, we have a- Can I, yeah. A, it's really, the, the oak tree is so large and the branches are up pretty high so that and it's in my front yard. I wouldn't describe my front yard as particularly shady. It gets shade, but the angle of the sun gives us a lot of sun on the front lawn. Um, okay. So I suspect that I can get some grasses and interesting things growing there, but I'm, I'm envisioning just all these leaves being dumped on top of the stuff and picking it out by by hand to clean it up somewhere. Maybe it doesn't, won't need that. That's what I'm thinking about. So if you have a planting bed, ideally uh, it's your front front yard. So, um, you know, people are pushing not to pick up your leaves, not to use all the resources to, to pick up your leaves, just leave them where they are. Um, if you've got plants with grasses and ferns, let's say that are growing there, you you still probably would want to cut them back and you'd have to rake that up. So that would be the maintenance that you would do once a year. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank sure. you, and I think we have time for one more question, which is perfect because there is one more question in the chat. Um, and Kathy asks, is the preparation for planting plugs the same as you described for seed? in terms of removing the weed and grass, et cetera, that's there? Yeah, so with seed, you have to get down to the bare soil so that the seed comes in contact with the bare soil. With plugs, as long as you kill what's there, you can leave the dead grass or weeds and dig holes in between. Uh, so it's not exactly the same. In both cases, you do have to kill what's growing existing there but with seed, you really have to get to the bare soil. So what we've done is we've, we've killed the grass and then we use a power rake to rake up all the debris so that it's down in bare soil and then we seed. Um, and with plugs, you saw the picture, we were planting into dead grass, so. Well, thank you, Jay. We timed that perfectly. It's 10.59, and that was the last Great. question in the chat. Um, I so appreciate this. You did not see all the thank yous and accolades that have been popping up in the chat, thanking you for sharing your wisdom, your time. Um, everyone um, says their eyes are now opened. Um, just so you know, this is streaming on my Facebook page. Uh, so Brittany put the link in the chat. Um, so if you want to reference this again or share it with someone you can always find it there and it will live there as long as Facebook exists. Um, thank you Jay uh, again this has been so helpful I feel like we have to do this again sometime <laughs> maybe outdoors one day um, and uh, I see Brittany is saying uh, yes she's adding more propaganda into the chat with links um so and we will also email um anyone who registered uh as i mentioned we'll email that list of the books the places you can uh, buy plants and um some of those deer resistant um suggestions that jay mentioned so thank you all for joining have a wonderful saturday <laughs> bye 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 thanks stephanie you're welcome Thanks, everyone.